Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Matt. I am part of Team Psychosmos, and we're going to do a lecture today. It's going to be very fascinating. It's going to be very good. Um, yeah, it's going to be great. I'm excited, pumped. Yeah. I've never done this before, so don't judge me too harshly. Uh, my name's Matt. Like I said, the guy over there right there is Rich, and that guy right there is Tyler behind the camera. You guys are not on camera, but this is being recorded. Feel free uh, to log some questions if you have some. Uh, I'd like to just kind of blast through this because there is a lot of material. I'm going to try not to go so fast. If you guys really do have like a super serious question, feel free to throw your hands up. Um, but let me tell you at the very least um, like who we are and what we do. But first, I want to give a big shout out, big thank you to that lady back there and Dr. Ginny. Touchlight's awesome. They do a great job. They take care of us. Actually, a big part of this lecture series is going to be incorporating a lot of the sciences of why you guys even come here and do the things that you do. Uh, a lot of this is going to be on the nervous system today. Um, but let me first at least introduce myself and my team. Um, we're just a bunch of kids and we essentially are just a team dedicated to bring higher consciousness to humanity, saving the world, things like that. Some fun stuff, you know, the world's kind of on fire today, so, you know. And you can, you can just imagine I'm like on TV right now because I got this little mic microphone here. Um, so, psychosmos was a combination of the words psyche and cosmos. It's, it's basically like a combination of the faculties of everything having to deal with the human body as well as like the entire universe. So, how do you live the best experience as a human being? How do you function to the best uh, of your ability is basically what we're trying to get at. It, it, anybody can come in if they're, yeah, okay. All right, cool. Um, anyway, yeah, this is just some stats about us that are really not important, but the big one is that we've been friends since childhood. So we've actually all known each other since we were about seven years old. Uh, we all kind of gravitated towards each other from a very young age. Um, I actually met both of those guys in elementary school. So we've been doing this for a while. We've been studying this stuff just because we were dorks. We were total nerds. Uh, you could probably take a look at us and figure out we weren't football stars. Um, but the big thing of what we do is actually like pretty much all listed here. I'll, I'm not going to rattle off because it's unprofessional. But we'll, uh, we'll just leave it up for your own description um, to kind of read. We studied like a wide variety of topics. A lot of it has to deal with esoteric wisdoms which pertain to some of the greatest and largest cultures that have been all throughout the, the centuries, thousands and thousands of years, as well as things like psychology, philosophy, biochemistry, and things like that. So really what we get at is combining all of these to kind of find one, one true hidden message if there really is one, and it actually turns out that there is. Um, and we're going to get into that. But first, this is just one plug. We wrote a book. It's very, it's big. James actually has a copy of it. So do the people here at Touchlight. Um, a lot of people seem to enjoy it. I'm not trying, I'm not a sales guy, so I'm not going to sell it to you. But if you are interested for the source material for today's lecture, this is the only time I'm ever really going to bring up the book itself. I am going to allude to it later on with this cover. So this cover here actually is pretty detailed. By the end of this lecture, I'm hoping that a lot of you guys can kind of piece together or at least break apart what a lot of this stuff means, because probably everybody's staring at this like, what the hell is that? Um, but again, uh, that's the only thing. So this is really what we do. We look at, we, we've studied deep esoteric artworks from any style, any time period, especially things that are really hidden that a lot of people don't know about. That's actually basically what esoteric means. It means hidden, you know, veiled, something that uh, a lot of people don't know. And again, by the end of this lecture, I want to kind of make more sense of what this means from a very simplified perspective. And the reason it's important is not just because this is cool, because I think it's cool. It's actually because this has everything to do with you and 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 you. It all actually, this is you. And I'm going to explain how this is you in reference to all the stuff that we're going to get into. But my question is, what can we grasp from this? So I don't want answers, but just like kind of think about it in your own head while we go through this lecture. When you look at stuff like this, does it inspire you? Does it motivate you? Does it want to make you work harder, be a better person? That's uh, the type of stuff that we kind of fixate on. But let me get into the objective for today. I'm going a little fast only because there's like 60 slides and uh, it's a lot of stuff, but I am going to make sure that I get to each and every one of you if you do have questions, so I don't want to leave anybody behind. This is what we is essentially presumed on the, uh, the little sheet, the little sheet that was out there. So we said we want to talk about secrets about the human body. Those secrets are going to be in relation to the alchemical body, patterns of life, nature, and creation. Um, we're going to explain more about how the human body heals itself. This is where we're going to talk about the anatomy of the body, energy, a lot of that kind of healing, things that you actually come here to touch light for. 
Uh, and then we're, and then of course emotions as well. And then um, how to enjoy the ultimate human experience, mind, body, and soul. And then finally hidden health habits. And this is actually where we're going to get into a really big topic. I wish that this would work on the TV. The sacred secretion. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this. If you guys haven't heard of this, this is uh, actually kind of a big deal. Not going to lie. Um, this is something that we've been researching for a very long time. Over 10 plus years of research has gone into this. It's something that has changed my life. All of the people's lives who are working alongside of me and everybody that we've been helping online. Um, again, you know, we've got tens of thousands of followers. A lot of people are preaching that this is really just a great style and structure of uh, different ways to understand life of what it means to be a human, right? Um, so my goal by the end of today is not only to have you guys like kind of think about some of those paintings and stuff, but I want you to feel like this. Um, you know, it, this is Mer Mercury or Hermes, obviously, from the Greco-Roman faith, and it, more of an androgynous figure than a, than a man, but even still, this is, uh, you know, he's kind of wrapped in this, like, DNA. I want you guys to feel, like, illuminated after this. I want you guys to kind of walk out. Um, not that, you know, that's not insulting anybody. You guys are all here for, obviously, your own spiritual reasons, but I want you guys to, at the very least, from this lecture, kind of look at life maybe in a different way. Maybe it's the same way you've been looking at it, maybe not, who knows. But my whole goal is to kind of inform on a lot of the sciences and how we even got here to this, you know, this moment in history. So, the human body. Everybody here who comes to Touchlight uh, is focused on wellness. They're focused on spiritual wellness, physical wellness, mental wellness, this is all tied in. Maybe you like yoga, maybe you like meditation, Maybe you're really big into the spiritual practices, praying, these types of things. Um, there's reasons that we're kind of called to these. There's reasons that these kind of gravitate towards us as we, as we age or we get older. Um, you know, I don't see too many kids doing that, doing these because they already kind of do it, right? They, they're, they're happy. They're already, for the most part, meditating and doing their, you know, they're playing, they're stretching. This is just something that's very common with kids. But as you get older, you know, you start to ask deeper questions. Um, and really, in relation to the body, what we're really getting at here is the human nervous system. So the reason that you guys come to Touchlight is because they assist you fixing your human nervous system, but also this is in reference to meditation. This is in reference to yoga, yogic practices. This is in reference to, hi, how are you doing? Um, this, this right here is what it's all about. This is why you guys come here. This is why you guys show up. It's really in regards to healing the nervous system. There's even you know some charts all 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 around um, that they have, and this is this is important. This is very important. I'm going to detail why. Not just because obviously it's part of our human existence, but there's deeper reasons as to why the human nervous system was so very crucial in the development of not only human cultures and mythologies, but also in the way that we live our lives every single day. This is how you think, this is how you feel, this is how you move, this is how you do everything. Um, so it was very important, you know, you've probably heard of things like the tree of life. This is the tree of life. You've probably heard of a lot of different ways in which this has been described before. We're actually gonna get into that a little bit later. But human nervous system, super important. Uh, so we're gonna get into a lot of sciences, especially more medically related sciences because it's actually all the same stuff. The medical sciences that we've discovered today and in the last 50, 60, 70, 80 years is actually same stuff that the Egyptian embalmers were saying 2,000, 3,000 years ago. This is not new, nothing was actually discovered. This is things that have been rediscovered as we've kind of gone through the motions of humanity. In the 1980s, they made this rediscovery of something which has been called neuroimmunology. Neuroimmunology is basically the medical uh, science of how the nervous system ties into organs within the body. That includes the brain, that includes all the organs in the mid and lower parts of the body. Um, and it's super important because your nervous system is impacted by your emotions. Your, your physical traumas, mental traumas, et cetera, et cetera. So basically what they discovered was, okay, your emotions can actually cause organ failure. Your emotions can actually cause your body to degrade over time. If you don't have this lying in tandem with the rest of the body, the nervous system, and everything's all working functionally, this is where diseases and a lot of illnesses and things like that end up occurring. So this was actually a pretty big discovery back you know, 30, 40 years ago because they, up until this point, thought that maybe it was a little corollary, but you know, not really. And actually, a lot of this came from the spleen. Spleen is a super important organ. I know a lot of people have heard otherwise, but the spleen is basically the immune headquarters of the body. So, so what they did was they cut 
a, a cadavers, the dead guys, spleen in half, and they discovered that the nervous system was so deeply rooted in the immune headquarters of the body uh, that it, you know, it's no wonder that we are now seeing not only a rise in, uh, you know, basically people's dissatisfaction of the quality of life, and we're also seeing a rise in illnesses, cancers, heart diseases, things like that. So these things are actually pretty corollary, but this is only scratching the surface. Um, because like I said, this stuff was not discovered, it was rediscovered. In fact, a lot of cultures, Greek, Indian, Vedas, uh, the, uh, the, the Jewish Hebrews, they had a, uh, basically this belief that you didn't have one brain, you had multiple brains. You had three brains. Three major brains, and of course they weren't actual brains, but what they were were nerve, nerve centers. The, the three brains would be the head brain, the heart brain, and the genital or digestive brain. Um, so basically one, two, three. But they work all in tandem with each other. And the reason that they were so epitomized was because these were the three major parts of the body where all of the nerves were basically bundled more than any other parts of the body. And this actually became a major aspect of the divine trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, things of that nature. I'm going to get into how these things all play in very soon. So the Vedas, the Indian people, they believed that we had seven major centers within the known body, known as chakras. Everybody here has probably seen or heard of chakras, I'm assuming. Each chakra was ruled and is ruled by archetypes and different attributes. Um, and this was something that was actually pretty well established. There's um, a lot of different ways that, like I had mentioned before, mainly those three groups, the Greeks, Vedas, and uh, the Hebrews. They saw different ways that the body kind of was built. They saw that there were a bunch of different bundles of nerves and different nervous points all throughout the body. And they said, you know, this is pretty important, at least to the human experience. Because if you, for example, let's say you have your heart chakra blocked or something along those lines, then that can actually harm your, your heart health. So it starts metaphysically from an energetic perspective, because of course emotions are energy. And then that manifests into a physical illness or something along those lines. So what we're really getting at with the chakras is, again, the nervous system, the human body, this, this, what, this Merkaba chariot, this tool that you have to use as you kind of co coexist all through life with a bunch of different people and you intermingle with everybody else's different energy. We're going to get into all that in a second. But mainly, chakra system is all about how the body, especially the spine here, you know, is kind of interladen in this system. And it's very important um, because, you know, the chakras, as a lot of people know, um, different nerval points, different attributes, different archetypes. If you have different blockages, then, you know, like I said, it can lead to physical health. But it goes deeper because it's not that simple. And this is where we come in as these, what I will actually call experts in a lot of these different fields of study. It's not just seven chakras. They also have a 12 chakra system. And in fact, if you've been here at Touchlight sometimes, um, you know, depending on what kind of service you have, you, you know, you might hear Dr. Ginny or Dr. Tina say something about the 10th chakra or something along those lines, which is outside of that scope of seven. Why are we getting these repeatable numbers? We have seven days of the week, 12 months of the year, but we have seven chakras and we have 12 chakras. Why are, what's up with all these numbers? Trinities, threes and twos and all this. Um, this right over here on the left, this is actually a diagram of a more advanced form of chakral meditation. It's called Kundalini. And Kundalini was actually, it's a very big deal, especially to the Vedas. It is not something that I recommend anybody rush into because it can cause a lot of nervous system issues if you're not ready to fully activate it and fully incline your body in this energy. However, Basically, uh, you know, it, it works in a cycle. You have these, uh, these two systems here, the uh, Pingala Nadi and the Ida Nadi, and then there's a middle, which is the Shashumna. Again, we're seeing a trinity here. And these three systems connect the body. It's, it's basically all interladen with the spine. Energy runs up, energy runs down, and it's a recycling effect. So just keep that in mind for a little bit later. We're going to get into more of that in a second. But I wanted to just kind of show this from a perspective of, yeah, it actually does get more complicated. Now, this next thing I'm going to show you is actually like pretty complicated. Um, this is the Jewish Kabbalah, if anybody's ever seen this. The Kabbalah is what the Jews call the pathway to God. And basically, this system is, uh, it looks super complicated. There's a lot of Hebrew letters and stuff. But once again, it's actually completely interladen with the human body. Okay, so the, there's actually 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chakras right there, all interladen, maps over the body. And this right here is actually what the uh, Hebrews call um, the winding serpent, and it goes up. There's also a lightning bolt that comes down. So this is the lightning bolt of creation that comes down. The serpent rises. This is the exact same thing that the Indian Vedas talk about. They talk about energy coming down and then the kundalini rising in the human body. Okay, so this is actually very deep, esoteric ways in which to utilize the full, full functionality of your body. But again, this is like super complicated stuff. I don't want you to get super uh, lost in the artwork here, um, but this is what we study. It goes into a deeper concept, as above, so below. Anybody ever hear about this one? As above, so below is basically a metaphysical hermetic concept. Hermeticism was something that uh, was created roughly about 2,000 years ago, right around the time of Christ. And hermeticism basically details seven different hermetic principles. Again, we're on this number seven. I'm going to show you why these numbers are important a little bit later. As above, so below is the concept that uh, anything that's below is also a reflection of anything that's above and also vice versa. Tree is a very easy example to see. You have this middle line here, you have a bottom, and you have a top. Once again, we have a trinity, even just in a tree, we have a trinity of sorts. And anything that is above is also below and vice versa. The guy who really coined this, his name was Hermes Trismegistus, just as a little history lesson. Again, this, these were the guys, these hermetics, these hermetic Gnostics, these guys played a huge role in writing the New Testament of the, of the Holy Bible, just, for, just so that everybody knows. These guys actually were like considered very wise sages. They went all, they traveled all around the world, very similar to what people uh, theorize about Jesus Christ's life before he was crucified. Um, and they, again, had seven main hermetic principles. And today, specifically, we're going to fixate on only two of them, really. And those two are correspondence and vibration. The first one, correspondence, is as above, so below, which is the same as what I w had just previously explained. The second one would be vibration, which is basically everything is moving at all times, even if you think it's not. Now, quantum physics tells us that this is true because quantum physics says, okay, well, you have waves and you have particles, but at the very deepest core, you have atoms, molecules, quarks, planks. Planks are the smallest unit of measurement that apparently scientists claim that they can find today, and planks are literally nothing but little vibrations. So depending on the frequency, depending on the vibration, every single molecule of your body is actually made entirely up of energy. So everything is energy is basically the, 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 the big point to grasp and take away from that. But what does that actually mean? What does that mean to me? What's the practical sense of understanding or knowing that? It's your spine. It's in your spine. Your spine is a wave. Your spine, especially from the side view here, the posterior view, you, you are a wave. In fact, uh, that's actually, if everything is vibrating, that's how we determine who's attractive and who's not. Muscular men make often a V-shape up top and a V-shape down. It's a curve. Women, I don't even have to get into it. Curvaceous. Waves. What do you do when you want to meet a girl or you want to meet a guy? A lot of the times people dance. This is a wave. This is just a wave. It's all waves. So everything about our existence at the smallest point is energy. It's, it's wave-like particles, and uh, it's even determined in our, root, highly rooted, deeply rooted in our subconscious, the way that we perceive things. So, it's, again, a reflection of the human body, as above, so below. There's actually a lot of elements in this body, and again, if you remember what I said, the, the, the Greeks, the Indian Vedas, they said three brains, one, two, and three. This one's the center one, and then these two are basically like a, a flipped reversal. You probably heard, you know, that person's thinking with their, right? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So there's a reason why people say those types of things, and it's because you actually can. You can be misguided by the different energies in the body if they are not in the proper alignment, if there's those traumas which are backing up energetic points that allows energy to flow throughout the body. And there's a lot of energetic points in the body. Again, it's not just seven, it's not just 12, it's, it's probably a, a bunch more. But as this science kind of progresses, it helps us in learning how to heal. Okay, so why these numbers? Why two, three, seven, 12? Why are these such a big deal? Well, I'm, you know, if you actually look, these were some of the original ways that numbers were initially invented. Um, this goes back, I don't even know how long, but you can see that each number was designed 
to house the amount of angles within each number. These are the same common numbers that you use every single day. You read them, you know them, and you never probably thought about that. Because this is the way that, again, these things are hidden. They're, they're not in plain sight. They never were, and they were only meant to be uncovered really during this time period. Um, but the numbers appeared in nature. They have set rules, they have set boundaries, they have set attributes and alignments to them. Duality, Trinity, 7, 12, they were very important to wide slew variety of cultures. We're, and again, we're, we're going to show some examples later on. But the point I want to really get here at here and kind of um, you know, go in on is uh, we're, we're going to kind of focus Trinity 7 and 12 next. We looked at duality. We looked at correspondences. We looked at as above, so below. There is some form of duality in nature. In fact, uh, you're split in half right down the middle. It's two, two halves. You need a mother and a father to make you. So th there is a duality to nature, but there's also a trinity. So let's take a look at the Trinity. Uh, does anybody recognize this painting? This is just going to be a real quick, easy example. This is called Salvatore Mundi. It was painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Now, this is a really cool painting. Not a lot of people actually know that this painting even exists. Salvatore Mundi means savior of the world. It's a depiction of Christ on his right hand. He's pointing upwards, and on his left hand, he's holding this orb. And, you know, maybe the gears are starting to turn a little bit here. It was uh, painted in the 1500s AD. Specifically to da Vinci, it's very important to him. He really loved this painting. Um, he wrote about it in his journals. Um, but the real reason why it's important and why I decided to do it today is because of this bullet point here. It holds the secret of the Trinity within the painting itself. Um, and the Trinity itself would be Jesus being the Son, Him pointing up to the Father, and this is a representative of the Holy Spirit. The reason that I'm, I'm using this painting as an example is because it was one of Leonardo's lesser known paintings, but it was the most expensive painting that was ever sold in an auction for $450 million. What do the rich people know that you don't? That's what I want you to think about. What do the rich people who spent four hundred and I would like that money. Who would like $450 million? I'm sure everybody's hand would raise. Why did they spend that much money on a painting? In fact, a lesser known painting. This is one that people often like don't even know about. It's because there's a trinity hidden in the painting. And we're going to get into that. So, trinities. One trinity is in the brain. You have, uh, you know, again, we talked about that trinity that was already in the body, but you also have a trinity in the brain. There's a bit, I mean, there's multiple different ways that people interpret it. That's kind of like where the, these lines get blurred and people get confused and nobody really has like the, the real concrete answer. Zoom out a little bit. Just think like just generally speaking. There's mainly three parts to the brain, the inner brain, the, the cerebrum, and the cerebellum. So you have the, the, th the inner thalamus, which would be that third part. You also have those three parts, as I mentioned before. This one shows four, but it's the three I want to point out are the brain, the heart, and the gut or genital, which is, again, these three major points that a lot of these cultures studied and looked at. Um, but let's do something more simple. How about, like I said, father, mother, and child? That's a trinity that exists very easily within nature. Every, every single person in this room has both because you need both in order to be a person. You make up that last point. So you don't have to be a mother, you don't have to be a father, but you will always be a child to somebody. That's kind of just a, one of those aspects of nature that just is accepted from the get-go. This trinity is also seen in the Holy Trinity that we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit, Spirit of course is something which is invisible. Spirit is something that's not seen. The Catholic Church really likes to worship Mother Mary. And the reason for that is because, and this is why you have actually so many denominations of Christianity, is because there's basically a big argument. Who do we worship? Do we worship the Son? Do we worship the Father? Or do we worship the Holy Spirit, the Mother? The, you know, this is either Mother Mary or sometimes even in like Rosicrucian texts, it's, Mother, uh, it's uh, Mary Magdalene. Or, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not preaching here. The whole point I'm trying to have you look at is to deconstruct how exactly this is seen not only in a lot of the major world religions, but also in every single aspect of your life, in nature, and things like that. Why did we make these things the way that they are? This is the Indian Vedas. They have a trinity, if you didn't know. Brahman, Vishnu, and Shiva. This is their Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Actually, Shiva is the Holy... Uh, the, well, yeah, it's the Holy Spirit. But this in and of itself is a trinity. This is on the other side of the world. How did these people have the same trinity? as the people on the other side of the world. It's because this is all connected 
and everybody is seeing the same things thousands of years ago, even though we didn't have internet, we didn't have cell phones. This is all deeply rooted in the human subconscious. And again, this plays into that picture that I, I demonstrated at the very beginning of this. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in the middle. Okay, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father is the one at the top. The, the Holy Spirit is like the, the, the mother. She's like the womb of space. Think of it this way. Okay, This is why the mother is often attributed many times to the Holy Spirit. You have the paternal source energy, which is this electric energy, a lot of the time associated with the sun here, more of an electric directive energy. The moon, magnetic, which is, again, another aspect of femininity. Um, women are oftentimes more magnetic. Men are more direct. Men often, and these are just normative gender roles that I'm talking about here, of course. But the father is more of a direct figure. The mother is more of a magnetic figure. And then the, the child, which would be the star, would be electromagnetic. This is actually why it's so uh, heavily um, influenced in the tarot deck, specifically. There are tarot cards, which discuss this and talk about this, too. Um, but wouldn't it be weird if like all the major world religions followed that same paradigm? Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And now you're sitting here telling me, but Matt, that cross is not a sun, except that it's often many times shown with a sun, and it details the son of God. There's a lot of actually implications. In fact, the cross originally, the Ankh of Egyptian cultures, was in reference to the equatorial horizon, our, our plane of existence, of being here on this earth, where we have north, south, east, and west. It's four corners. This is why Jesus Christ was specifically crucified on a cross. But the cross often is depicted with the sun. So here we go. There's your three major world religions. There's your trinity. Even in the scientific community, quantum physics, all that, they talk about a big bang. The big bang theory. Everybody's probably heard about this. This is where source energy was all pooled into one thing and then it exploded into this vast macrocosm which created all of creation. This is just what the modern scientific community says. But you know, if we turn it on its side, I cannot tell you where I've seen that same schematic before, but it looks really familiar, doesn't it? So basically, the brain, which is our biggest nerve center of the body, which is being right at the top, this is why the Bible says, in my opinion, you are made in the image of God. Okay, Because if this is the way that the universe did end up ultimately creating itself, well, if this is where people are, and this is the genital brain, isn't that how we reproduce? We reproduce through the genital regions of the body. This is where matter is the densest. This is where everything occurs. This is just one example or one schemata. We're going to get into the seven now. So we went with duality first, then we looked at trinities a little bit, now we're going to look at seven. Seven deadly sins, seven holy attributes, seven chakras, Seven major planets, okay? You have seven major planets. These were called the wandering planets. They were planets that did not move against the fixed background. So all the wise sages back thousands of years ago said, well, those guys must have something going on. I mean, th there's literally every single star moves the exact same way almost every single night, just off by a few degrees because of where all this stuff is moving. And yet these seven spots, that one's red, that one's Mars, you know, that one's Jupiter, Saturn. These are all moving in really odd ways. Um, and, uh, and so the, uh, additionally, the brain can also be broken down into seven pieces as well. So first we saw the brain as a trinity. Now we're seeing it also as septenary, which means it's broken into seven. Um, and then you have these seven major planets. You have a seven major chakras, seven, a bunch of seven stuff. Um, there's also seven, and this is like one of those big things that's very highly discussed because many pe different people have uh, different opinions. But like I said before, zoom out, generalize it a little bit. You have seven major organs. It's not really like super concrete set in stone, but seven major focal points that all align with the chakras. And you also have seven major uh, body bodily systems. Outer skin or the genital body, I've seen those interchange. And then skeletal, respiratory, muscular, circulatory, digestive, and nervous system. Why is it important that I'm bringing up seven? It's because you live by it every single day. What's today? What's today? Thursday? Thor's day. It's Jupiter's day. Yeah, these are all named after the planets. Sunday, moon day, tears day, Woden's day, Miercoles. Latin, Spanish, doesn't matter. These are all the same. These are seven planets, seven days of the week, seven in the body. They're all transcendental. They're all essentially the same. Now, 
the reason why we chose these numbers 7, 12, you know, they break down really, really well as far as the grand cosmic wheel goes. The sun in the sky is moving around, all that stuff. Um, at least from our perspective, it's moving around. But, um, you know, this 7, this is something that we use in everyday life and people never thought about it. Never thought about it. Oh, it's a Sunday. Why is the name that? You know, and it's, and again, it's in many different languages, including um, a lot of uh, uh, the languages. There's like multiple different languages in India, but even in India, their days of the week in most of their languages are named after the, the seven planets as well. And their, their names are much longer, but I don't remember them off the top of my head. Uh, but you can fact check me on that. So again, we're seeing seven here. Seven arc attributes, seven, seven, seven. Now we see 12. We see 12 months. We see 12 tribes of Israel. We see 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. We see 12 celestial objects. So remember those seven I said before, we'll go back. The sun, the moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. These can be seen without a telescope. These can be seen with your naked eye at all times that there's, you know, if it's a night sky and it's clear, you can pretty much make these out at almost any point. The other planetary objects, which they actually, you know, you have people like Plato, you have uh, Indian scripts, a lot of stuff detailing about, even, even um, the Kabbalistic uh, Hebrews, they talk about uh, 12 objects, which would include Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, the first asteroid belt, um, and the Earth. So that's a total of 12 right there. You also have 12 zodiacal signs. And now why did we break this up into 12 and 7 again? We see it in the human body. There are 12 cranial nerves in the brain that connect the 12 major systems that the brain houses and controls. So now I just showed you the brain is broken into three, it's broken into seven, and it's broken into 12. And this is all corollary. So this little diagram that we have over here actually shows how the, uh, each one of these uh, 12 zodiacal signs, like the chakras, have archetypes that have to deal with one twelfth different part of the human body. This is something that was really heavily studied. Lots of sciences behind it. We're going to get into that. Anyone know who this guy is? This guy is Dr. Wilhelm Heinrich Schussler. Dr. Schussler discovered that there were, once you take a body, a dead body, and you burn it all away, there's essentially 12 minerals that are left behind. And so what he decided to call these were the 12 cell salts. So even after you are nothing but ash and dust, you epitomize into 12. Then another guy came along later on. This is Dr. George Carey, and uh, his assistant was Dr. Inez Perry. They both discovered that there was a link between the body, the cell salts, and the zodiac. And what they found was that depending on when you were born is actually indicative of what type of deficiencies or illnesses you could have solely based off of your birth solely based off your birth. So for example, my friend over there, Rich, he's a Pisces. My grandmother's a Pisces. My sister's a Pisces. All three of them have iron deficiencies. All of them. And iron is the ruling cell salt that has to deal with that energy of Pisces. So it's, it's less of a, like some, you know, guess. There's actually a lot of science that has been purported towards this, but it's still obviously being uncovered as we go along. They also found that because you have nine or ten of these cell salts in your body after you're born, there's, a, there's this event that occurs once a baby takes its first breath, the energized particles of the air fills the lungs, the amniotic fluid leaves the lungs, and essentially those 12 cell salts in the body are, are almost weighed in a sense so that whatever nine or ten that you have ends up gravitating all this energy towards you. This is why you, know, you have people who are into horoscopes. This is why you have people who are into astrology. Uh, because there's actually a legitimate science. They've found that the zodiac runs parallel with the 12 different parts of the body. And then each of them are also ruled by a specific cell salt, which in fact is ruled by a part of the brain. One of the 12 cranial nerves. And this is all medical science. This is all stuff that you can find online. You can Google it. And like I said, it's in the back of our book, all the source material. But the, the, each one of these signs, starting with Aries, ending with Pisces, has to deal with the body. And in fact, uh, this, this one's kind of cheesy, but I'll just bring it up. Even in the medical field, even in the medical field today, this top of the brain is called the, cere the cerebrum, the cerebram, and the bottom part is called the cerebellum, because that's Aries and Taurus. That's the lamb, and that is the bull. What is this called? The sagittal region? This is Sagittarius, the hips. In the medical field, they call this the sagittal region. 
So there are ways in which the medical field actually took from this wisdom. We're going to get into that more later. They took from this wisdom and then like never referenced it, never talked about it ever again. And this plays a, this plays a big part into how one goes about living their lives. Because um, again, there's actually a whole science here where uh, the body corresponds. I know they're like all in this like weird pose. I wish I could do that. Um, they're they're in this weird pose. Each sign rules specific parts of the body, and uh, it can actually have a big impact on your life in uh, as far as energy goes over time. Because it's all about cosmic space radiation, basically, and different planetary objects work as like different little magnetized points of light and gravity. And then your body fundamentally makes itself. This is why all babies basically look the same when they come out of the mother's womb. But then over time, there's actually a whole science on how different zodiacal signs look. I'm a cancer. I got the big chubby face. This is like a big moon face because cancers are known for having that. Um, okay, so moving on. Energy. Who knows what that is? Organ pyramid? Anybody know what that is? You guys seen this before, I'm sure? Okay. The guy who made that, that's this guy. You probably see these at expos, these little like pyramids. They got like crystals and stuff like that. And this guy is Dr. Wilhelm Reich. He was a guy who had to flee Nazi Germany during World War II because he had a bunch of science. He's also Jewish. Um, and he rediscovered energy within the body and outside of the body known as a toroidal or torus field. Uh, he coined it as organ energy in reference to the word organism because this is something that everything with living DNA has. This is some an energetic presence that all things have and uh, yeah he was arrested and thrown into prison and he died there because of this discovery they actually went and took all his work burned it didn't want anything to do with uh that stuff but yeah big big deal and i told you we were going to be heavy on the scientific stuff with the doctors this is what a toroidal field looks like um this actually this bottom left image here this is uh directly from a declassified cia document so there so the cia is talking about this by the way just so you guys know um, this one over here was also taken from a book that the CIA had uh, basically put on their banned book lists. Okay, so that's just an image I got off of Google. But these, these are basically the ways in which you have this, again, invisible field of energy which is constantly flowing through you at all times. It's constantly keeping you tapped in and connected. This toroidal field is in parallel with all the other stuff that we're talking about today. This over here on the left is called Babbitt's Atom. This is, a, I want to say, like a medical journal from like 1912. This is what they thought an atom looked like before they told you what atoms look like. So back way long ago, over 100 years ago, they said this is what an atom looked like. Looks kind of like a human heart. Looks like a torus field itself. And in fact, I got a, a bunch of nice stuff here on the right. Did you know that the human heart's magnetic field can be measured several feet away? In field development, heart forms one of the first things. Negative emotions, this was a big one, can create nervous system chaos, but positive emotions do the opposite. So again, who here has ever sat there and you were doing whatever, and then somebody walked in a room and let's say you love this person and you just feel it right away. Like you're so happy to see them. You haven't seen somebody in a long time. It's like, oh, it feels so good. Now, how many of you have sat there and you see somebody you absolutely despise and you can't stand? And they come in and you just start to feel it. You just, oh, I don't want to deal with that. That's because this, this is interacting with your this. So your field interacts with their field. It causes uh, an energetic reaction. A lot of it's visual, stimulated by you seeing them, smelling them, hearing them. Anything, but that's all light. This is all energetic particles. And it's such a simple thing, but it's very, very heavily scientific. It's very deeply rooted in a lot of this stuff. Um, so you can boost your immune system by focusing on positive emotions. That's also very true. And again, that, that has to deal with that heart and splenic center of the body because the spleen is that immune headquarters of the body and it's very very close to the heart um, this is also the way that we have the earth's magnetic field so this right here is the sun and the earth and this is what modern science today nasa and all that claim the earth's energetic field interacts with the sun so of course this is it facing but if you look real close there's like a little head and a body it's like a person. It's like an energetic field of a person right there. And that's everything. It's the earth, it's you, it's your DNA, it's all the cells that you know undergo mitosis. Uh, it's the galaxy, it's a tree, it's fruit, 
it's everything. Toroidal energy, this energetic field, every, anything that has DNA has this. That includes the planet. That includes anything living. Anything living with DNA, spiral DNA, like this, it's the same structure. Anything with that, anything with that, has that. Plants, fruits, animals, everything living. Um, trees. So this is a caduceus, as I brought up earlier, Mercury, Hermes. This is his uh, staff, his staff of wisdom. You often see this probably the most at a hospital. Why? Why did they choose that as their symbol? Why not a pill? You know, that's what you're getting when you go there. Why not, uh, I don't know, something else, Smokey the Bear. Why'd they choose this? Why'd they choose that symbol? Symbology is a lot deeper than we think. Symbols have a lot more meaning than we might think, in fact. Um, and our ancestors saw it, a, a lot of things in very different ways. This, again, Caduceus is a really great example. Um, because the medical industry, in my opinion, stole this symbol and they placate it to pretend because it, it's all subconscious. Your ancestors, no matter where you're from in this room, all knew what this stuff was about to some degree. Not all of them, of course, but a lot of the wiser ones knew a lot of this stuff. So this plays on your subconscious. So when you see that symbol, you say, oh, they'll heal me. They're going to fix me. Because this symbol has been used in temples of Asclepius in the Greco-Roman parts of the world and in the Egyptian parts of the world for over 2,000 years as a way to say, this is where you get healed. This is where you can come for a doctor. And additionally, this is also the brazen serpent in the Bible. There's a story about the brazen serpent coiled on a staff, and all that reject the brazen serpent will fall to the snake bites. Something, something along those lines. But you get my point. Here's a picture of Thoth. Uh, Thoth is the Egyptian deity of wisdom. Here he is. This is a, a 1920s depiction by John Augustus Knapp. He's holding that staff of Mercury while he's got one foot on the evil dragon. Okay? Why am I bringing this up? Here's another one. This one's a little more complicated, and it's also a little risque. That's okay. This one, again, more complicated. What, what is all this symbology? What is all this? Why does this have to be so complicated? Well, maybe let's break it down a bit. I mean, we can see two pillars here with the sun and the moon. We see trinity here. We see duality here. We see whatever the hell that is. Um, you know, but it's, it's literally all these things I'm talking about, duality, trinity, th these are just symbols that they're hiding in plain sight. And yet the people who are at the upper echelons, the people who have a lot of power, people behind closed doors, they know a lot of this stuff. This is how we ended up learning this stuff. They know a lot of this stuff. What about this one? This one is outside of a German hospital. You can see this guy holding that staff right there. And, and, and who's this? Who's this over here? That's death. That's right. That's Grim Reaper. That's death. That guy, he's no bueno. We don't want him. He's got to get out of here. So what is this guy doing? He's holding him back, holding that staff. Now, do you think that that staff represents the modern hospital system that we have today? Is that what he's saying? No, that's not what, that's not what this is. That's not what this is. What this is, is you. That's what that is. It's you. You are that staff. This whole system in your body, that's the caduceus. That's what... Mercury, Hermes is trying to bring to you that wisdom, that elevated consciousness, how to take care of this entire thing so that you can activate all the parts of the body so that you can become the best version of who you want to be. Um, so the Kundalini Yoga, as I brought up earlier, this, this Kundalini chakra system over here is the same intertwined serpents that are on the caduceus, on the staff of Hermes. So again, India, Middle East, Europe, Africa. I should actually not say India, I should say Asia just in general because the Chinese have Qigong and they're very big onto this too. Okay? How did all of these cultures, you could argue the Silk Road, you could argue trade and, ca and capital, you could argue anything. How did they have these same principles deeply rooted in their subconscious? It's known by a lot of names, what we're talking about today. Kundalini is one name, uh, Holy Grail, the Philosopher's Stone, Prana, Amrita, Soma, the Alchemical Marriage, 
the tree of life, the land of milk and honey, the bread and the wine, the holy oil, the Christos, the sacred secretion. This is all the same stuff. All of the stuff that you hear in a lot of these different esoteric works, these different cultures, these different mythologies, these different nations, they talk about this concept which is called the sacred secretion. I got a little picture of Jesus here. Sacred secretion. This, uh, this does actually have to do with Christianity too. This actually is a very big part of Christianity, believe it or not. Um, as I said, I've, I've been bringing up a lot of those different examples, including that one picture by uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So these people studied this stuff. They got the deeper complexities of what a lot of this was about. Um, the sacred secretion, because now this is actually the whole reason you're here. I'm just going to let you all know. Today's a full moon. I'm exposing this stuff because that's what you do on a full moon. You expose the secrets. The sacred secretion is a biological process which goes in your body. That, and it happens, uh, from our estimation, roughly about once a month. Runs pretty much in tandem with another cycle that we know from our, our female friends here called the menstruation cycle, which also happens roughly once a month. Okay? Men have this too. They just don't have it as painfully obvious, I should say, because it's, it's painful. But there's an energy or wave-like pattern in our bodies, which we have been made very unaware of over these years. And the process is actually all about mastering yourself. It's, all, it's about aligning all of those energetic centers, becoming the most elevated, most consciously aware person that you can be. And basically, some times of each month there are, are better for healing or partying than other times of the month. And it's actually very important. I've been doing this research now for over five years. Yeah, you're good. You're, you're good. You're good, Ron. You're good. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're not in charge of anything. You're fine. Um, I, I, we've been doing research on this and practicing this for over five years. This has fundamentally changed my life. It's changed these guys' lives. And really, it's just living a healthy lifestyle. I mean, it's, it's, it gets so unbelievably complicated that it's actually really simple. It's very simple. Um, so again, research continues on this topic. We're just exploring it. You have a lot of different people talking about this. What, what we see here in this body, right up here, I really like this image. As above, so below. You have this connection, okay? And the brain and the sacrum are very, very, very interconnected. They're very interconnected. There is a lot that goes into this. But basically, and, and the thing about today was I wanted today to be the prepper so that maybe we can do a part two. We can actually discuss this in full scope and tandem because this is a very deep concept. As far as the, you know, the build up to this goes, it was a lot. We're still in it. But essentially what happens is once every month, there's a part of your brain called the claustrum. It's almost like a satellite. It takes in an energetic vibration which tells the body to undergo this process. For a lot of women, this is where you will start your menstruation process itself. Um, or, or it doesn't have to be. We're still trying to figure that out. I'm actually, I get data from women all the time, so I'm actually really trying to work with a lot of ladies on this to try to piece together more info on if there really is a difference. The reason is because a lot of the people who talked about this and wrote about it were all men for the last thousands of years. So I want to incorporate how we can take a look at the, the female aspect of things. It's been, it's been a journey, trust me. I get, I get women. I had one woman the other, the other week send me... Um, uh, and I'm keeping her anonymous because she asked me to. I had one woman the other week send me uh, the last 30 years of where she detailed every day that she had her menstruation cycle. And she said, I, don't, I knew one day I was going to need this. I didn't know for what, but I, I'm just sending it to you. So I've been studying that. And there is a cycle. She, she has a cycle every 25 or so days. The moon has a, a cycle of every uh, 28 or so days. Uh, but there's a lot that goes into that. Basically... A lot of different chemicals and signals are produced in the brain, specifically from pineal and pituitary gland. They go down, they go down the body. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, chemicals that occur from the spleen, the adrenal glands, the liver, the pancreas, um, and all this. All these chemicals basically congeal. They go down into the sacrum, which is deep down here. This is like the ba base spine bone, uh, all the way deep at the bottom. And uh, there's this. Um, there's this energetic kind of battle that ensues. This is also, again, this has to do with menstruation as well. Um, and from that, this is like the good conquering the evil. You bring this energy up through yoga, meditation. You're all subconsciously doing this. Some of you are doing it right now. I don't know, I don't know everybody's cycle. I would have to talk with you specifically. But there's ways to track this. And uh, it, it runs in parallel with all the major mythologies. It runs in parallel with Christianity. Jesus Christ was crucified. 
he died, and then three days later he was resurrected. Well, that's actually the exact same aspect of this process. All of these chemicals combined, and then they, they travel through your hard effort, through your, your hard work, if you're not wasting and squandering this, because you can. Um, and a lot of people are talking about this now. You raise this up into the brain, and it basically creates this chemical concoction, which pushes on the inner fulcrum of the brain, which does a lot of stuff, actually. We're going to get into the benefits, um, because these are all scientifically backed. Um, it heals the body uh, by uh, uh, by releasing cerebrospinal fluid. So this, the whole end goal of this is essentially to create more cerebrospinal fluid within your body. So your body recycles chemicals. Think of it this way: your body recycles chemicals once every month and creates cerebrospinal fluid. If you decide to drink or have excess uh, uh, sexual relations or anything on these times uh, of the month specifically, it harms your body more than it helps you. And then there is also opposite times where it's better for you to you know party and get drunk if you really want to. But it's basically like your body has a cycle is what I'm getting at. But you can heal the body. You can reactivate dormant brain cells. You can reverse aging and prolong life due to the release of somatostasin and uh, the other soma chemical, which is also released from the brain. Um, but these are all hormonal. These are all hormone related. So again, we piece this together in our book step by step by step based on taking all these scientific case studies that they've they're scattered they have nothing to do with each other but what we did was we combined them because it's point a to point b to point c to point d um you live more in connection with nature's ebbs and flows mental spiritual physical clarity uh, become less susceptible to outside energies this actually strengthens your own energetic field uh spiritual euphoria uh, it actually proliferates stem cells uh which is super crucial um, and then some people claim even like again spiritual euphoria connecting to God things like that there are ways in which we understand cycles today fact number one the moon controls the tides everybody agree with that that's what science says right moon controls the tides water comes in and out high tide low tide all right fact number two humans are 60% water you guys see where I'm going with this fact number three I don't know what's the connection this guy is Dr. Eugene Yonash. Yeah, they're connected. This guy is Dr. Eugene Yonash. He discovered in the 60s that women ovulate and menstruate roughly like 60-70% of the time in accordance with the lunar cycle. And the other 30-40% to 40 of the time they're synced up with other individuals through that toroidal energy. And you know what happened to this guy? Uh, all of his works were desecrated and then shortly after that they created birth control. Um, so the moon, which is again that Holy Spirit, magnetic, and more invisible force. Everybody agrees the sun gives you light, gives you energy, it's good for you. Nobody ever talks about the moon. The moon controls the cycle of energy in your body as it ebbs and flows up and down, up and down, every single month. And this is actually what causes a woman's menstruation cycle in her body. It's not like it has a super direct impact, but it's enough where they were able to scientifically prove it before this guy was basically shown. They wanted to give him a Pulitzer Prize or, or a Nobel Peace Prize or whatever it was, and basically he was completely annexed and shunned. So there are lunar cycles. Wouldn't it be weird if the moon also controlled things like the stock market? That would be really weird. That would be so strange if there was tons of evidence to prove based off of the last 30 or 40 na years of NASDAQ data, that the moon controlled the emotions of people to make decisions on how to buy and sell. We can afford a $450 million painting. Right. <laughs> Who can also afford a $450 million painting. Well said, Ron. So the point I'm getting at is, what about post-operative uh, post morbidity? What about people who die after they've been operated on? Yeah. That's linked to the moon as well. Cops will tell you that there's more crime on a full moon than any other day, any other phase of the moon. That makes sense. There's we more babies born. Yeah, and there's more babies. Ooh, there you go. More. Well, okay, tonight's a full moon, so everybody be careful. <laughs> um, yeah, but know someone who's close. There, yeah, there you go. You're right. But this is what this is really what we're getting at. There are lunar cycles that are. They're not just for the body. They control people. Actually, lots of old cultures said that the moon controlled people's emotions. You can track different planetary objects at different points and they mean different things. Now, does that mean that they rule you? No. Do I worship the zodiac? Hell no. That's the, I don't worship that stuff. I, that's not to be worshipped. That's not something that you play with. This is something that you study as a science. 
because there is a real science to it. And we have these people who are really rich and they pay other people to make these BS horoscopes. And that's basically, you know, a big, uh, big part of, you know, what, what it is that we're getting into. But lunar cycles. So I actually have a guy I want to give a shout out to. Um, on Instagram, that's his Instagram uh, hashtag if you want to follow. He makes a ton of really good diagrams, things that you should eat, things that you should avoid um, during this process. This process is too complicated and way too extensive and deep to cover in one uh, lecture. So this was kind of like you could see as a part one in some sense. Um, but I will tell you that uh, th that's actually a big part of our book cover as well. Maybe now you can start to see where we got some of this symbology here. Uh, because we got the seven chakra systems that related to Kabbalah. We have a trinity here, you know, right here. We have the 12 zodiacal signs, seven chakras. This is you. This is the world you live in. This is who you are. This is everything that your ancestors fought and died for is so that we could be here today discovering and discussing this stuff. And it's so easy, guys. It's just live a good life. Live a good life. Don't don't go squandering things. Don't go wasteful. Don't be, you know, be negative when it needs to be and no other time. Be positive for the majority of it. Enjoy your life. Live well, you know. There's a lot that goes into this. And so, like I said, I'm not going to go over it all today. But my whole goal with this lecture today was to hopefully make you feel more like this guy. So uh, there's a lot that went into that. But uh, once again, um, we got Q&A. So I guess this is where I'll just pause because I was I've been talking and rambling for like an hour and I can if anybody has questions uh, if you want to address them later on I'll be here for a little while um, or if you want to raise the questions now it's a good time to ask um, but I'll open the floor if anybody's got any questions no I don't know if I got questions but it is all related okay how deep you want to go right uh, yeah so yeah as, or, as you're learning or crawling and walking on the yeah yeah yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. There's, there's, there's lots of different ways in which, again, the, the numerology, all the, all the different ways in which our culture is kind of expanded on, you know, everything. They wanted to understand when I look up into the sky, what am I looking at? Why is that there? Stuff like that. Um, any, any questions? What do you think about three, six, and nine theory? Oh yeah, with Nikola Tesla. That's, well, that's a big deal too. Three, six, and nine. Each number, you know, numerology, they, it has some kind of correspondence to it. Three, six, nine is just a way in which uh, these three numbers all play into each other and how they explain the universe. You know, three and nine obviously makes twelve. Um, three and six makes nine. Things like that. So there's like all those different mechanics of how he used all that. Um, energy to create the things that he did because again it's just it's frequencies vibration i think nicole tess has even stated he's like you know once you understand everything is frequency of vibration everything else makes sense um and that's that that is actually a really good quote because it plays into the different numbers it plays into the body it plays into quantum physics all that so um yeah good question though. um the, any other questions no so pyramid got doing all this the pyramid? Pyramids. Like, like pyramids in Egypt? Yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot, it depends on who you ask. Uh, for example, um, if you read Manly P. Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages, he's like an old Freemason. He, he discusses how the pyramids were, um, you know, nobody lived in them and nobody was, nobody was embalmed in them or anything. They were used as like an initiation ceremony. They were used as a telescope. They were used as, uh, they had like some kind of embalming thing in the pyramid. There's like... Uh, there's like a lecture hall or something along those lines. Um, a lot of people have different beliefs on those pyramids, but um, a, another big one is that they're like energy housers. They got water underneath them and they can kind of en house energy. Um, something I'm not really an expert on, but I will say that they were really, really important at the time. Um, the Sphinx in Egypt, which is right next to the pyramids, was actually built so that it was facing the horizon. And they built it to look like a, a lion with a man's head because it was built during the age of Leo, which was about 12,000 years ago. Um, and that actually, again, that plays into a big thing on astrology as well. There's a whole place. You guys have probably heard we're in the age of Aquarius. So they were in the age of Leo 12,000 years ago. That's when they built that Sphinx, supposedly, in relation to that age. I heard the Sphinx was actually a lion face originally. Lion face originally. I could, I could believe that. Big, big bolt of lightning or something like that. I could, I could believe that. The pharaoh, I guess, you know, had three faces when he looked like himself. That's what I've heard. Okay, that that I could definitely believe because the whole the whole aspect of it was as a uh, almost a sense of worship yeah. to that age. That's why. So six thousand years ago, this is a side thing. Six thousand years ago was the age of Taurus, 
And if you study all the different world religions, they, um, the Indias will say Brahman was a bull creator. Um, the, the Nords will say that the, um, the universe was created by a bull deity, a bull god. Um, and uh, in the Bible, you have Moses on Mount Sinai, and they're worshiping the golden calf. And he comes down, and he says, what the hell is this? This isn't what you're supposed to be doing because that was in reference to astrology. They were worshiping astrology. They weren't, they weren't supposed to do that. Nobody's supposed to do that. It's supposed to be understood as a science to better understand our place in the world. Um, and it's still a science that's expanding on today. But um, the, it's a bigger deal than people think. Like, uh, for example, in the, Bi the original depiction of the Bible nowadays, you know, in our little manger scenes, we got a donkey. But it was originally a lamb and a bull was watching the birth of, of, of the Christ. Um, and that was in reference to the fact that right before Jesus was born, it was the age of Aries and the age of Taurus. So, he, so basically, like, they were waiting 4,000 years for this Messiah to come. And there's a whole thing. I could do a whole thing on that. I could do a whole hour-long lecture on that. I won't um, because, like, you guys will be here forever if I do. Um, but, yeah, really good question. A lot of astrology. Uh, it's, it's way deeply interwoven into not only our subconscious, but a lot of our mythologies and the way that we understand the world. Again, 12 months of the year. Why, why 12? You know, because you, you can do the math. You can break it up into a bunch of different days. You can do three months of, you know, however many days that is. Uh, 120 days. You can do three months of 120 days. Why didn't they do it that way? Because they specifically said, they boiled it down into 12 major aspects. Um, you know, in the Greek version of their, one of their stories, they have Dionysus, which is uh, the son of Zeus, which is basically like the epitome of God. And Dionysus is almost like a Jesus Christ figure to the Greco-Romans. They actually had a whole, the Romans had a whole thing called the Bacchic Rites. It was very similar to the early stages of, of the Catholic Church and before it was taken over and became a sex cult. But um, the Bacchic Rites detailed that Bacchus, which was like the sun, was brought up into the heavens and was torn apart by the 12 titans. The 12 titans is the zodiac. So, so this is paramount. This is like very deeply rooted in many different cultures. Yeah. They also heard about the uh, like, like Yaku or Jacob, the heel, heel grasper. Heel the heel grasper. It's yeah. weird yeah. that you said that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's actually really weird. With uh, so uh, Jacob and um, his brother uh, uh, Esau. Esau. Right. Right. Or Esau. Yeah, that one is that one's really big too. That that one's actually got a deeper secret. I, I know a lot of the Kabbalistic stuff behind that. Um, but yeah, grasping the heel. He's actually J Jacob in their Hebraic translation means like the deceiver or something along those lines. Um, and Esau, that that's like a whole story I could get into. But that's actually a deeper story, which kind of is talking about like Christ versus like Satan in a, in a, in a in a deeper sense that's actually one of the like the ways that they they basically have perpetuated all of these stories in different names and nomenclatures throughout history in different ways but they this is also definitely subconsciously connected all these different places all learn the same stuff um yeah I have a real quick question yeah, so yeah. about the sacred secretions sure when you talk about you like you said you don't know specifically what cycle we're on, but this is what I heard. I don't know if mm. research proof sure. that it happens when the moon is in your Sun sign. That's correct. Is that correct? That's correct. Especially for men. I think that for women it could potentially be different only because again only really men from like Freemasons, Rosicrucians, you know, Illuminati, whatever, like these people who are in these upper echelons safeguarded this stuff. And then what they decided to do is they kind of got evil like four or five hundred years ago and they decided to use it against us. Um, and that's actually why everything is inverted today. That's why everything's flipped. Nothing's this, nothing's normal. Not everything is basically they're trying to destroy, they're trying to poison your food. They're trying to like, it's crazy. All that, you know, and more um, is because they wanted to safeguard and keep this stuff away from people uh, because they didn't want people to, to awaken in that sense. But people subconsciously knew it and just did it already. Um, but yeah, so basically when the moon enters your, your sign of birth, right? So right now, anybody who was born in uh, October, like my friend Tyler over there, is going through their cycle or supposedly should be. Um, and like for us, we've tracked this and this, this works for us. I've heard different things from different people. But ultimately, yeah. What's your, what's your sun sign? Capricorn. So when the moon goes into Capricorn next week, you would be going through your cycle. Yeah. 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 So, so, like you're saying, I mean, it's basically you don't squander. That's right. Year. So yeah. is it like, you know, during that week, 
during that nods and that's I would say so so I recommend multiple different breakdowns. I first tell so the moon goes into each sign roughly for about three days. This is of course in relation to Jesus Christ dying in the womb or dying in the tomb uh, for th- for those three days and then being resurrected. This is because that's actually what happens in your brain. All these chemicals travel up into the brain. They sit there for about like three days or so, um, and then there's a lot of flourishing that occurs because of this chemical concoction that's created, which stimulates the pineal gland, which causes uh, the pineal gland to illuminate, which pulls on this part of the brain, the inner thalamus called the fulcrum. Um, It's actually called a much longer name, but I can't remember the scientific medical name for it. And then that ends up basically flexing the brain, which causes a, a, a spark of cerebral spinal fluid to flow out of it and then down the central spinal column. The, when the moon goes into the sign before you, yours, which would be um, Sagittarius, that's where your body's prepping for this. And then during those three days is where it sits in the brain. So I normally tell people start with a three day thing, then go for a week and then do it longer um, and it'll work. But it's all about balance. Right? It's not it's not about worshiping this process. It's not about you know, it's just about understanding that some times of the month are better for you to heal, connect with God, connect with source, connect with whatever the universe, whatever you want to call it. Um, heal yourself, heal your mental body, heal your physical body. Um, and then there are other times of the month where you're more grounded. Uh, it's better to ground yourself, it's better to be with friends, family, maybe party a little bit, enjoy your life. You need the ebb and flow of of all of the energy because you as a uh, again you're made in the image of god if god is everything then you also to some extent have to be everything too but it's a balancing act it's not bad stuff you don't want to do the bad stuff but it is a balancing act so yeah good question <coughs> when do you know uh, thanks for coming your, appreciate it what's in your um, cycle so you can track the moon you can figure out where uh the moon is in the sky you can use like a bunch of different apps i use a website called astroseek uh, that one I feel like is pretty good. Um, there's like a bunch of different websites and apps. So, but basically right now we're having a full moon Libra. Full moon, by the way, if you didn't, Libra, that's yeah. yeah, that's you. So you're you're doing this right now. In fact, I met a guy uh, this past. All the time. Yeah, well, I met a guy this past Saturday at an expo. He said the exact same thing. He was like, "Yeah, I heard about sacred secretion. I'm trying to figure it out. Like, when is it supposed to be?" And I said, "What's your sign, Leo?" Well, moon's in Leo. You're doing it right now. And oftentimes, I'm going to tell you what I told him. When you find out about this stuff or when you learn more about this stuff, it's often when you're going through it because this is how energy works to magnetize towards you. So you learn about these things. If you go back and you think about events that have happened in your life and you compare that to your astrology, you can actually find like, huh, there's a lot of correlations there, a lot. And again, you know, full moon, full moon's all about exposing, exposing emotions, exposing feelings, exposing information or wisdom. So we're all here at a lecture exposing this on a full moon. So this this is, again, it just plays in perfect time. I didn't even pick this day, even. like the, I think we moved the schedule around, too. So this was subconscious. Yeah, I, th- I think I think we were originally supposed to have this next week. But then I think some of them got moved and stuff, and so here it is. It just fell into place. But that often is how energy magnetizes itself. It's why you guys are all here today. Um, so, so, yeah, but good question. I My would, appointment, first, first appointment here was at 444. Yeah, there you go. Well, so yeah, if you're big into the numerology, it's the same thing. You you see the numbers, you see the patterns, you see this. This is just this is energy magnetized towards us to some degree, to some extent. So, um, you know, I'm not gonna say that uh, it's all 100% concrete, but basically the way that I see the world is in this lens. And I'm telling you, once you start to see these types of patterns all throughout nature, you start to really realize how much of a bigger person you actually are in the grand cosmic wheel of things. You do matter. Your, your choices, your decisions, every little insignificant thing, it matters. It does. And so doing it with the utmost best intent is the best way to live. It's one of the best ways to live. You, you Positive, fullest intent with just wanting to help and heal and do that stuff. That's that's really what it comes down to. It's not about worshiping the zodiac or a process or whatever. You have so many people today who are really into this stuff, but they don't even know where to start, and they get sucked into a bunch of different rabbit holes. We had each other to make sure we didn't get sucked into those rabbit holes. Then we tested this stuff. So it's not just some fanatical belief. This is stuff that we've tested, taught to people, and have had other people come back and say, yes, that works. That worked for me. And I've, I've only had one guy, one guy say, Nope, doesn't work for me. I hate it. I'm not doing it. You do not want to know how that guy's life is panning out right now. Yeah. You do not want to know. It is awful. So, yeah. Um, and that's not like 
that's not a threat, by the way. That's just no, that's just good. that's that that wasn't my that wasn't me. That was just him. Like he he didn't want to listen. He's a sex addict. He's got a bunch of problems, and so his life is now just in shambles because he has no habitual control over himself. We as a society are over sex. I don't tell people don't have sex. I tell people, let's look at our bodies and let's understand how it functionally works, so that we're not again squandering or wasting our own essence because that's. That, that, that plays into a big role of that connection with your partner. Um, so, yeah, it's all, it, it, a lot of it's energy, too. Um, and I could, again, do a whole thesaurus on that because I've dabbled with the Kama Sutra a little bit. So, um, But, yeah, any other questions? I feel like we're really I, late here. I, just one thing is, um, as far as your real mission with all of the research you've done, yes. all like that, Tell us what, give us a little more clarity about why you're doing what you're doing and why you're sharing this with the world. Really love that. I'm glad you said that because uh, that was something I was debating on even even putting in this lecture. Um, but basically, there are people out there today who don't have the world's best interests in mind. I'm not going to talk about that because I don't want to fixate on a negative topic. But you can see it. Everybody here sees it. We see that the world's not the way that it's supposed to be. This can only be considered an accident or a coincidence so many times before you really start to see this as being done on purpose. And you basically have two groups, of, I would say maybe three groups of people. people. One group is people who just don't carry the way. One group of people is really set on trying to lower the vibration of this world. And there's a reason. There's actually a deeply metaphysical reason for this. That is because what they're trying to do is lower the source's vibration. We are connected to source. They want to lower and bring source down to us, and that causes calamities. That causes um, that causes source to end up sending its son of God to do things to change the world. They're trying to force an event. Um, you have other people who are on the other side of that, which would be the people in this room. And they don't want to do that. They actually want to elevate and raise that vibration up. We all want to go up. So you have people who want to drag the world down, and they, their method of attack is your ignorance. Their method of attack is, you don't know why the hell I paid $450 million for that painting, you rhubarb. Like that's, that's what they think. And they think you're all dumb. They hate all of us. They poison our food, they poison our water, they do all this stuff. I'm not going to get into it because I'm not going to get negative here. But you guys have seen this. So what we're doing is we're really just conscious, consciously aware of that, battling that by bettering ourselves. Because each person – okay, there was a, a study that they did. It's called the Maharishi effect. What they did was they took, they took, a, they took a group of people – and they said uh, it was very crime and poverty stricken and they took about one tenth of their population and said you're all going to meditate and pray. We don't care what God you believe in. You're going to meditate and pray. Put good positive vibes out there. They decreased the crime by over 5%. They increased the financial stability of the area. They, they, like they, the whole quality of life took a step up just from a group of people sitting on the floor and sending out good vibrations because it was karma. You, send, you, you get back what you give out. So they were told, think positive, loving, and et cetera, et cetera, and everything was made better. So to answer your question, the reason I do what I do is to save the world. I do what I do to bring the power of the people, the wisdom of the people, put it in your hands so you can make the decisions that you want to make. So, you know, and I can't make you make those decisions, but it seems like everybody here wants to make those decisions. So you do that so that essentially everybody is elevated, everybody is raised up altogether. That's how you combat this garbage that we're having to deal with today. And good conquer, conquer yeah, and it's really good conquers evil. Yeah, you, you have, and, and the whole point with the sacred secretion, the whole point with the mythologies and all this stuff, it's all within you. You don't need something externally. It's all from within. It's all from within. So you have to start there. You have to make those conscious decisions. You have to actually put in the effort. You actually have to do it. And that is that is and hang out with all those who have yeah, right the right vibration. right and that doesn't those mean who thank are you in the lower vibration. right so we so yeah, you right. can't yeah. you can't reject the we physical world yeah yeah it's community you can't reject the physical world 
But all the mental, spiritual, emotional stuff, that starts in here. So when you guys decided to come to Touchlight so they could help with your neurological system, as they've done with mine, the whole purpose of that was subconsciously because you wanted to better yourself. You wanted positive change. You're already on that path. Um, and, and that is why we're building a community because we, we all can help each other get to the point of where we all want to be. We all, we all want to just exist peacefully, lovingly, not having to worry about this nonsense that you know, society is bringing down on us right now on purpose. It's not, this isn't all accident. If this is an accident, you know, uh, I mean, that's the best accident that like I've ever seen in my life. Cause like, this is just chaos now and it's done on purpose. It's done with intention. Um, so, uh, but to her point, um, when you get to that point, part in your journey, a lot of the time, it, it, it's, it's very difficult for people to find that balancing act. You have to balance the inner worlds of yourself, like when you're laying on this table with your face down, they're, they're working on you. You're in yourself. You're, you're downloading yourself. You're, you're downloading source. You're like, you know, you're healing through the power of your own mind. They're just, they're assisting you and they're doing all that chiropractic work because everybody has trauma. Which is helping the cerebral spinal fluid yes. flow like he was talking about. So that's a lot what it is that we do here. Uh, not just the that. cerebral spinal fluid, but also just the nervous system health in general because it's, it's the fluid and it's the flow of energy within the body. If you have blockages, like I said, you have a blockage in your heart chakra, your heart center, your heart nervous system, that means there's not enough energy going from your brain to your heart. That can cause your heart to fail. You can get heart failure. Um, so like it's, it's all, it, it all is very corollary, but yeah, um, what we're doing is building this community now so that we can all educate and heal each other. And you can't, you can do it alone internally, but externally is the problem because externally is ha is more than half of life, you know? Um, and we all live in this world. I see p people all the time who get really sucked into this spiritual stuff and then they say, oh, well, I'm just going to reject the world. And they do crazy, weird things, in my opinion at least, and they hurt themselves. And then they sit there, I don't understand, why am I not manifesting money? Why am I not rich yet? I, I thought I would just sit here and pray and pray and just be positive all the time. Life doesn't work that way. Life is a balance. So sometimes you need the energetic perspective, sometimes you need the physical perspective. That's where they come in. Well, actually, they come in in both because it's, it's both. It's physically unlocking all of the spinal column aspects of the body. And we all have traumas. Even me, I'm young, but I have physical trauma. That's why I go to these guys, because I, I, I do my yoga, I do my meditation all the time, but I still have those major stresses in my life where I'm like, oh, this is heavy. That's where I get to come to Dr. Jane and Dr. Tina, and they get to help me out, as they've helped everybody else out. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think with that, I'm way running my course here, so I'll put a pin in it, but um, of course, I want to say thank you all for coming hopefully you guys can understand this stuff a little more thank you to touch light once again you guys are amazing we love you guys so very much thank you for letting me ramble and, uh, thank you okay